Praise the Lord, preachers. Hey, back in class again, week number eight, and we're excited. <laughs> we're excited to be on a very passionate topic concerning the messenger today, realizing again that out of the message, the messenger, and the audience, the messenger would be what is most important because we skew everything that we touch it is going to be shaped and altered by our disposition, our wording, our inflection, our attitude, and our spirit, which will be most important, and even beyond that. So it's so extremely important that, that we maintain this vessel, that you and I recognize that we are the vessel of God, and consequently it's so important that we are taking care of the, of the vessel, the the treasure we have is in this earthen vessel. And so when we reflect on that, we, we think about Paul. As a matter of fact, it's in the writing that you read from jars of clay, how that uh, we are a jar of clay, that if it's abused, misused, it ends up being uh, cracked and even broken and can be destroyed and likewise you and I must realize that we have in us the treasure of the universe, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, and I yet am a clay jar. I yet have the potential to be affected, destroyed, and broken, and therefore I must maintain my vessel because if I break, then what good am I? And if, if I have my entire focus on everybody else to where I spend myself, uh, then, then what happens to the real effect of the ministry? And so in the famous book written by Rick Warren, The, the Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church, he comments in the opening remark, he says, it's not all about you. Well, then it begs the question, who is it all about? If it's not all about me, then who is it all about? If I don't maintain a focus on me as the messenger and I end up breaking and then many, many people are affected, then the question again is, who is this really about? So now we ponder that question to say, really, it is about the vessel that I am. I must realize it and I must maintain my vessel in honor. And so in doing so, I need to manage stress. Managing stress in the ministry because when we're going, we look at stress, we realize that stress impacts literally every system in the body. And so I come looking for people that have circulatory issues, uh, their cardiac, cardiovascular uh, systems are being impacted, maybe elevated levels of cholesterol, maybe issues concerning heart respiration. Uh, anybody with digestive issues and concerns of respiration, how about asthma? How about uh, other concerns like that? Uh, Crohn's disease, digestive issues. Uh, when we look at stress, we realize it touches every system. The, all, the immune systems, the mental psychological uh, systems, the nervous conditions, anybody with muscular skeletal problems, respiratory issues, anxiety or anger issues, well, just looking for people <laughs> that I love, friends that I honor, because every one of us are impacted by stress. 75% uh, of all clergy do not finish well. 90% of clergy uh, they migrate into another profession or retire outside of ministry. Ninety percent, nine out of ten people that sign up to be clergymen in America, clergywomen in America, give up somewhere along the way. And it, possibly even more tragic is that 75 percent don't finish well, that they break somewhere in the process. The average life expectancy of American clergymen is, was 57, now it's up a bit, but uh, in, in, a, in the study that this comes from, uh, dying at the average age of 57, number one cause of cardiac disease, number two cause because of cancer, number three is car wrecks, and, and uh, 
the, according to Archibald Hart, famous psychologist, United States president is the third most stressful job in the world <laughs> that's only outdone with the number two job in the world of stressful jobs, and that's the pastor. The pastor that carries the load of a church. And the number one job in the world is that of pastor's wife in terms of stress. And so a doctor friend of mine by the name of Chris Adams has been number one funded psychologist in the country uh, receiving grants to study pastors, pastors in particular. And this uh, individual, Chris Adams, hired a professional uh, study research individual that studies professions. Now, I don't have his name, but he would look at all of the professions and uh, analyze them, and then after three or four years, be able to strategize how to help. For example, the American Medical Association uh, strategically develop and, and help the doctors, and he did the APA, American Psychological Association. He studied all the various groups, and so Dr. Chris Adams hired this man to study pastors. He spent about three years studying pastors and came back to Dr. Adams and said to him, said, I, I have spent three years trying to figure out this profession, trying to categorize it like I have the other professions, trying to study it, analyze it. And can you believe, he said, in the three years, I still can't peg it. What a job description is, what's entailed in this, in this work. And, and uh, then he says, it is absolutely the most stressful the most stressful work that I've ever studied. There's nothing that compares to it. A 24-7, on-call, constant a burden, carrying the load of people uh, to support, to lead, and, and uh, to answer for, and, and, and drive budgets, and drive churches, and, and the list would go on as he's trying to parse out, what on earth is a pastor? And then here's the comment he made. He said, why would anybody on earth want this profession? <laughs> and the answer is, I don't know who wants it, but we're called into it. It's a calling, and it is the most stressful of all career, career paths, and you and I must recognize it. And I believe that we want to stop and pause in life right now and say, I want to finish well. I want to make it all the way to the end. I want to have a productive ministry that doesn't crash and burn along the way somewhere. That I bail out a ministry with some goofy moral charge. Or I bail out a ministry and turn finances upside down. Or I bail out a ministry because I contracted horrible disease. It's unreal when I look around at my peers and I begin to number the numbers of these precious brother that have had open heart surgeries and, and have been yielded to the knife because of really not managing stress well. We recognize we're in the most stressful of all professions and then we recognize that we must, of all people, learn to manage stress and manage stress well because chronic stress is linked to the six leading causes of death. Stress, the, the, it's the cause of death, primary cause of death, heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide, all being linked to stress. And so we must manage stress well. Stress compromises health and causes sickness. Hello. Stress triggers the oncogene and causes cancer. Hello. And on and on. We could talk how that it impacts every system, but let me narrow it down as we're going to try to help us understand because to manage stress, I believe, requires philosophical life changes. We must change our philosophy of how to live and, and how to minister. How can we minister effectively for the long haul and finish well would be pleasing to God. That if it's not all about me finishing well and making it to the end, finishing the course as Paul did, uh, and, and recognizing that he did finish well, finished the course, and got that crown of righteousness, you and I need and want to do the same. So we're going to walk through some axioms. Number one is to manage your stress is to manage your death. I don't believe God wants you dying early. 
I don't believe the Lord wants you and I crumbling and caving in and not finishing well, but He wants us to manage our stress as to manage our death. And if I'm not managing stress well, I am pushing myself early into the grave. Number two, to manage your stress is simply to manage your adrenaline. If I can understand the stress systems, the adrenaline system, the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems, if I can get my head around this, twist the screws in my brain, again, I can be devoted to a life that's going to be effective and finish well. And so what is stress? Well, stress is anything that will stimulate the adrenal system. And uh, in a similar way of saying, it's anything that would stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. The endocrine system is what drives the adrenal system. And so uh, hormones is the endocrine system. And of course, synapse, electrical stimuli and impulse is what is affecting the nervous system. So these two just flow together. And uh, anything that moves me in the uh, adrenal system from rest to digest to fight and flight, usually known as fight and flight, that's stress. Uh, anything that moves me out of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest again, into the nervous system, the fight and flight, the sympathetic nervous system, again, is a stressor. What is stress? Again, it's what impacts the entire body, literally every system of the body. It moves me from parasympathetic into the sympathetic nervous system. And, and if you can look through the spinal cord as we are watching the various impulses of the nervous system, touching all of the glands the, from the eyes all the way through uh, to the brain systems, to the heart, to what's in the center of our systems, into the digestive into the liver and the pancreas and the kidneys and small intestines, large intestines, and all the way to the lower extremities. Literally every system from the brain to our muscular skeletal systems are impacted by stress as it would shift us, stress shifts us from the parasympathetic into a sympathetic on charge, on demand type of a call and here's the twist. That's where we live most usually in life, in America, in the Western culture. Again, stated that the stress is going to affect literally every aspect of our being. It is going to impact us in our body with headaches and all kinds of muscle activities. Emotions get impacted. And uh, mind worry uh, is going to be impacted negativity and even of course our behavior stress impacts every area of life and so number three axiom is you can't not beat the effects of stress stress will beat you you and i can't beat it it will beat us if we don't get it into our heads and hearts it, it we're already toast it, it's already done I'll explain why we are so driven as pastors and preachers into the traps of stress. In a little while, you're going to say, uh-huh, I'm guilty. Uh-huh, I am predisposed for uh, the six leading causes of death because I have yielded myself to chronic stress. What is stress? It stimulates the adrenal system. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, again, simultaneously. It is simply defined as danger. Everything that spells danger is stress. When it's perceived by the five senses, when you look and see it with your eyes, when you uh, experience it touching your body, uh, anything that's perceived by the five senses, perceived by the mind, is stress. You pick up the mail and the mail's got a return address, maybe from... Uh, the IRS or from a bill collection or something like that, it produces stress. And the body knows no difference between physical stress and psychological stress. The body responds the same. Our physiological response is identical. If I'm running from a lion in order to escape 
That, of course, would be a physical challenge. If I'm going to war, fighting battle, there is the push of adrenaline. There is the sympathetic nervous system on high charge, high alert. And simultaneous to that or identical to that is whenever I have psychological stress, it's the same effect in my body. My physiological response is identical when it's physical or when it's psychological. Now, of course, you and I don't live under physical stress as much as our ancestors, but our ancestors have no clue of the psychological stress that we live under, and the body knows no difference. We respond the same way. If it spells danger, then we are responding to stress. God built us with the capacity to handle stress for a maximum of two weeks. Only two weeks. So what is chronic stress? Chronic stress is any stressor that lasts over two weeks. If you're in stress more than two weeks, then you're in chronic stress, and chronic stress is so damaging and destructive. And so what happens when the body spells danger? Well, there are 57 hormones that are released that come cascading down the HPA, the hypothalamus pituitary axis, adrenal axis, and uh, they are coming one after another. Adrenaline is at the top of the list. It flows into the area of the kidneys. Just on top of the kidneys are the adrenal glands that can shoot adrenaline throughout your body and instantaneously change your system through the effect of adrenaline. 10 seconds later comes cortisol, and uh, cortisol is going to reverse a lot of those effects of the adrenaline. And so the adrenaline affects every system. Now, I don't have time to get into all the stuff, not by any means, but this is just, I'm going to lead you to why you're going to see why preaching uh, is something that you, you esteem, you love to do. We, we asked the class some time back, why are you here? Why do you want to preach? Why do you? And one person said this. Uh, they fell right into my little trap. They said, because I love the high. I love the high. And in fact, that's the truth. You, you sense danger when you're standing in front of people. So the single greatest fear in the human being is a fear of death. The second greatest fear a human has is public speaking. And so you and I would stand in front of a crowd, sometimes hundreds of people or even thousands of people. And if you're Brother Michael Lindsay here in our class, you know what 35,000, well, I guess that's 70,000 eyeballs are looking at you as you're preaching the Word of God. And yeah, there's amazing, amazing fear that's engaged, danger, all those people. Second greatest fear to the human being. And what it does is send off all the alarms. Danger, danger, danger. And for example, in the circulatory system, we experience vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is when that we are, again, the body knows no difference of psychological stress and physical stress. So in a physical stress situation, I'm getting ready to go to war. I'm going to swing a sword. I'm going to be up against somebody in a battle. And I, my body is expecting for me to take a, a hit of a sword on my extremities, first of all. And so the natural response in my body is to squeeze these blood vessels in my arms and squeeze the blood vessels in my legs and pull all of the blood up into the torso to protect my blood because I'm going to have great blood loss in the extremities. And so vasoconstriction is what's taking place as it's protecting me from blood loss in a battle zone being uh, in, in warfare type of thing, or you can think of the many examples. And the problem psychologically is I do the exact same thing. I squeeze these blood vessels and I develop a condition called hypertension as I now have been so impacted, prolonged stress 
creating hypertension. Uh, in terms of circulatory, my body sends the coagulants into the bloodstream so that it's ready to coagulate the blood quickly, anticipating a cut, a swipe by a sword, so that now when I do get hit, my blood vessels are already prepared to clot and clot quickly and, and reserve the blood as a survival technique. And, and uh, so uh, when the, I, I first came, became acquainted with this concept under the reading of Dr. Archibald Hart that I referenced earlier, who, long story short, became a friend of mine. But anyway, uh, I, I read how that uh, blood clots is a side effect of stress. Uh, and I realized, wow, I've had three blood clots. And I thought, I am guilty of living under too much stress as I'm prepared to coagulate and I've got blood clots as a result. Uh, I send in cholesterol into my system, anticipating again the battle that's lying before me, either by physical nature, or maybe I'm running from a lion as an example, or you know, the many stresses that'll take place. I one time in the church told some of this, and I had a guy come to me afterwards and he said, you know. I can't believe what I did one time, but he said, I saw a horse fall on a little girl and I went over and I picked up a 900 pound horse. How do you do that? Well, you do that with the effects of adrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system and the power of all kinds of stuff going on in your body simultaneous. And here he did that as, as he no doubt experienced uh, this vasoconstriction, the coagulation of the blood in his, in his extremities particularly, and uh, elevated cholesterol because cholesterol is a lubricant. It's an oil. It's uh, designed by God to help you and I anticip anticipating the, the friction as we're moving fast and, and our joints particularly are taking the impacts of all kinds of motion and, and God built us to be able to oil the hinges, so to speak, just oil the hinges. And so elevation of cholesterol. But of course, when there's chronic stress, you end up with elevated levels of cholesterol over a period of time. Likewise, elevated triglycerides where the, the glycogen stores are being released because the body's anticipating needing to use all the, that, the fat and convert it into energy and use it quickly in energy. And so psychological stress sends the message to release those glycogen stores and you get end up, end up with elevated triglycerides in the bloodstream. And uh, consequently, it's not being burned off. Uh, and dopamine then is sent in to coordinate the heart rate, increase the heart rate, and uh, produce the appropriate vascular responses. Dopamine primarily is designed to manage this stress system effect under a physical type of a stressful situation. Uh, but the big piece is it twangs the pleasure center. Dopamine twangs, <laughs> twangs the pleasure center. It stimulates the pleasure center. This a piece of our brain called the locus accumbens is now because of God saying, I don't only want dopamine to coordinate the heart rate, but I want dopamine to also make you feel good. I don't want you feeling bad when you're going to battle against whatever enemy or running from whatever lion. I want you to get a feel-good sense and the pleasure center is going to be struck. And we're going to notice that the four uh, hormones that will affect the pleasure center are all given with altered alternative purpose. So for example, the dopamine is going to coordinate the heart rate and the vascular response, but it twangs the pleasure center. We notice that uh, the, the oxytocin is really a gift to propagate the species, the facilitator of life, and, and it stimulates the uterine contractions, mammillary glands, and cuddling, giving senses of cuddling and bonding, and the, the force behind the sex drive but it twangs the pleasure center also. These are survival techniques that God says, whenever there's a sense of danger, I want you, rather than feeling the danger, I want you to take pleasure. I want you to feel a sense of pleasure. Number three is serotonin. Number four is endorphin. So we just spelled the word dose. 
uh, a, the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitters are known as the happy hormones, and they produce a dose, a dose of happy hormones. Serotonin is, is given primarily to constrict the smooth muscles and to support the transmission of the impulses between nerve cells. Uh, the heart to be affected and the nerve cells impacted by serotonin and uh, but again it twangs the pleasure center in the brain we have a pleasure center and uh, then the fourthly come the endorphins that are to mask and block the effect of pain and uh, it, affecting the anti-pain system so that when you do get struck with painful stuff then you have endorphins blocking the pain and so danger causes that. Actually, uh, I, the pain can help mask the pain, but it, it twangs the pleasure center. So people will cut themselves. People will inflict pain upon themselves so that they can release these endorphins into their system and twang the pleasure center so that it feels good and feels like it's healing. This locus accumbens, the pleasure center, uh, is a bottomless pit a bottomless pit that can never ever be completely satisfied so a bottomless pit that's crying for more pleasure always wanting more pleasure a pleasure is addictive extremely addictive and we pause to say oh god let me have a balanced lifestyle whether I take pleasure in what you want me to have pleasure in, but I don't give myself to the things on purpose that twang the pleasure center and constantly are trying to fill this place inside of me, the feel-good, happy hormone place inside of me. The pleasure center always wants more, always crying for more. And so sometime back, uh, Scientists were doing research in the 50s. Actually, I've seen the video of this research when that uh, they found what we call the amygdala that is the center of the brain. It's an organ in the brain at the very base of the brain that when it's stimulated, it's, it's fear. It contains the center for all of our fear and anxiety. And, and so they found and discovered this that when they touched the rat's brain, with this uh, electrode to stimulate the amygdala, amygdala, it got angry. A rat got angry. One day, a scientist accidentally got his little electrode just slightly off, and he touched a piece of the brain right next to the amygdala, and the rat got happy. Now, these are great scientists <laughs> because they can tell the difference between a happy rat and a mad rat. So anyway, I don't know how you do that, but they did this, and they said, oh... There's not only an amygdala that indicates fear and anxiety and anger, but there's also a pleasure center. They ended up calling it the locus accumbens. It's the location of, of the accumbens. And, and uh, they then put the rats into test where to see how they could respond to this pleasure center. They wired them and allowed them to self-stimulate so they could push a button it would send the electrode around to touching that locus accumbens, and then they could push the button again and get stimulated again. And so uh, rats learned how to push a button and stimulate that locus accumbens, and, and literally they learned to do it very well. One rat could do it. He, he pushed a, a, the button every uh, se 72 times a minute. That's the record, 72 times a minute. Uh, quicker than once a second, he was stimulated in the locus accumbens. And of course, the other rats were doing the same, not to that rate. But here's what happened. Every single rat that was effectively wired to be able to self-stimulate the locus accumbens, not a single one of them stopped pushing that button. They did it for one day, two days, three days, four days. No, not four days. Sorry. They quit it three days because they all died. Literally, minute after minute, hour after hour, stronger than any survival need is the need for pleasure. 
pleasure more important than food, more important than anything else, according to the rats that were studied, that that locus accumbens is a bottomless pit. So everyone loves stress because everyone loves pleasure. So as I mentioned, there are the four hormones, the dose, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and the endorphins that are all released under stress to do other stuff in our body. They regulate circulatory, they regulate digestive, they turn the digestive tract off because when you're under stress, you don't need to be digesting any food. They turn the immune system off because when you're under stress, the immune system is unimportant at that point in time. And uh, they turn on the effects where that the muscles can really be strengthened and be saturated with the powers of the glucose and the other types of uh, chemicals to to release this energy, supernatural energy to do these amazing things. Every system is impacted. And in particular, the mental system is impacted because again, it stress twangs the pleasure center and feels good. See, everybody loves stress. Somebody says, well, I hate stress. No, the fact is you're a human being and you love to have fear. That's a reason a roller coaster is fun. That's the reason why various excitements are fun. You uh, call it entertainment. When the, there's the explosion, the bright lights, the sudden sound, the shocking, the, the stressful situation that somebody finds themselves in, in a, in a movie presentation or whatever it may be, we, it, it stimulates the pleasure center. And that's what entertainment is. That's what excitement is. And we love stress. We get addicted to stress because everyone loves pleasure. And so this locus accumbens is never, ever satisfied. There is the biofeedback system that begins turning off the neurotransmitter receptors. So when you're overstimulated, uh, the brain operates by having a stimulus come in and then that is from one cell uh, over a synapse, it connects to the next cell, locks right in like a lock and key. The key is received by the receptor, and now it sends a stimulus across the next neuron, where that it's going to shoot the same type of a response over the next synapse, creating the next synapse. And so this is what's happening is we're sending signals into the pleasure center. Receiving that stimuli is the receptor. And the more stimulus you get, uh, it, it takes more stimulus to get the same effect because you end up with receptors clogged. All kinds of receptors are clogged, and so you got to send in more stimulus to get the same type of effect. So that's the reason why the person that does the cocaine or the drug, so I'm told, that the very best high is the first high. And after that, you never get quite to the same spot because the receptors are jammed, they've been flooded, and now it takes more of the same type of stimulus to get the similar effect. And so what happens is the pleasure center begins shutting down, and as it's shutting down, as all there's been overstimuli, it now, well, how it does it, is it sends a signal, now that all the, the receptors are jammed, it sends a signal way back to the onset of where the stimulus is coming from and saying, don't send any more stimulus up. We got plenty of whatever the chemical is in our system right now, whichever hormone we're talking about. Endocrine system operates the same as the nervous system in this regard. And uh, the receptors are all full. Don't send any more, for example, adrenaline in. Don't send any more cortisol in. Don't send it in because there's no room for it up here. And, and so then finally it gets turned off and uh, now the, chem the, the uh, hormones being depleted, and slowly, slowly, the receptors that have been closed are going to open back up. But this takes about two weeks. That's the key point. After elevated levels of, of uh, the neurotransmitters, the dose, 
uh, subside. It takes about two weeks before the receptors begin the turning on process. So, of course, anybody that's done work with mental illness knows that the, those drugs take a while to get ramped up and they take a long time to come off of. And there's always a two-week process for receptors to begin the turning on, turning back on. And, and so everyone loves stress because everyone loves pleasure. And the pleasure center shuts down, creating anhedonia. Anhedonia is a condition where you can no longer feel pleasure. And when you go into anhedonia, you always, 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 if you continue to stimulate to get the effect of the stress, it's going to push you into depression. That's why after you've preached a sermon, after particularly on a Sunday, maybe you've done Sunday morning and Sunday night, the next day you fall into a depression. You, or even if you just finished a sermon on a Sunday morning, you get in the car and you sense a depression and begin to question yourself. How was it? What could have done this, that, or the other? Super critical. And uh, we, it's just a natural, it's good to know, it's a natural effect of the high that you cannot help because you've been standing in front of people. And now uh, you, you come right into a consequential uh, depression. And the pleasure center is shutting down, creating anhedonia, which always triggers depression. Again, this pleasure center is never satisfied. Dr. Archibald Hart gave us the book entitled Thrilled to Death and uh, teaching us that, again, we always want more. We we could be like uh, the gentleman you can YouTube it who dove off of a jumped off of a cliff into a pond, and there. Uh, why did he do that? Because he had bungee jumped before, and that didn't give him the greatest adrenaline rush that he wanted. And so it takes more of the same stimulus to create the same type of thrill. And so he jumped now right over water and would get the feeling of like he's coming into the water. And, and, and then that thrill didn't do him as high of thrill as what he needed. And so then, thirdly, he jumped again and now it's into crocodiles. That there's crocodiles in the pond and literally that's a picture of the croc coming up out of the water, coming after him. And I don't think it's a very good uh, end of story. But anyway, this pleasure center is so strong and we're wanting more, more, more. And we're pushing ourselves out of bounds into a place called anhedonia that's going to end up pushing us into depression and we can't help it. And so uh, as soon as the adrenaline's released, next 10 seconds later comes cortisol and it is going to dissipate 51 times slower than does adrenaline. In other words, adrenaline comes and adrenaline goes. Cortisol that comes 10 seconds after the adrenaline is there and it's going to be in our systems 51 times longer than is the adrenaline. Now, another point, a key a component of the cortisol is it passes the body-brain barrier. It'll go into the brain whereas adrenaline is not allowed into the brain. So cortisol goes into the brain affecting the, drain, the brain. What does cortisol do? Well, primarily it's going to reverse many of the effects of adrenaline. Now it does, it stimulates some stuff, but it reverses many of the effects of adrenaline. So it's going to withhold those glycer, glycerin storages where adrenaline saying, turn it loose, turn it loose, run it into the bloodstream. And it does. And we get elevated triglycerides. But the cortisol is going to come right behind and say, hang on, hang on, hang on. And we end up developing uh, belly fat. And we end up uh, with excess pounds because the stress is saying, oh, no, no. 51 times longer is the voice saying, hang on to all that fat storages. It's going to counter the pleasure center euphoria by creating anxiety and flooding the amygdala with anger and anxiety chemicals. Because think about it. If you have just run from a lion and you're doing your best to escape and now you climb a tree and you got all this adrenaline that's pushing you up the tree 
And of course, the lion has caught up with you, and now that you're in the top of the tree, what's the lion going to do? Well, the lion is going to remain at the bottom of the tree, and he's going to keep his eye on you until, you know, finally, you're going to have to come down, right? And so lion just sits down there, and if all this adrenaline is driving, 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 uh, now you need to be calmed down. And so cortisol comes literally to depress you literally to calm you down and again it's going to be in your system 51 times more and longer calming you calming you calming you when you know after the adrenaline's gone you really don't need to be calmed more but it's in our systems and it's functioning in the brain and it's creating anxiety and saying okay now you're depressed now you're you know calmed a bit now let's uh, get you worrying and help you think about how you're going to strategize to get out of the top of this tree. And anxiety is going to help me and it's going to flood me and even generate anger, fill the amygdala up with anger, anxiety chemicals. And as well as the cortisol is going to initiate other changes like inhibit the immune system. It inhibits the release of, of uh, TSH, uh, the... the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone it elevates anxiety it advances depression and cortisol again is going to stay in the system so much so what happens well stress is going to stimulate the hypothalamus and it, we're going to come now to in, to inform the pituitary to generate a thyroid producing sty, thyroid stimulating hormone that's going to crank out t4 and t3 and simultaneous we're going to have the hypothalamus engaging the pituitary and creating and releasing a, a chr hormone, hormone that inhibits the production of tsh and the adrenal gland producing the cortisol is inhibiting TSH, we end up with a compromised thyroid. And we now notice that in the body, there is a three-legged prong, three-legged stool, I call it, where we have a connection between the adrenal system, the thyroid system, and the reproductive system, all impacted by the pituitary. And if I get any one of these legs of the three-legged stool out of balance, out of kelter, then I end up with other flawed areas in life. So uh, whenever that I've, I am super adrenalized and I'm living in stress with elevated levels of adrenaline, it ends up turning off the thyroid and I end up hypothyroid or hypothyroidism, stress curve, Again, I can see at the onset of stress for two weeks, stress is beneficial. Stress is going to help me accomplish what I need to accomplish. I'm going to think faster. I'm going to respond better. I'm going to be stronger, physically stronger. I'm going to be more together. But after two weeks, if I've given myself to two weeks of stress, now I have the effects of the cortisol that's changing all the actions. And now chronic stress is working to pull me out of the stress saying you got to stop you got to quit this is too much and so at 9-11 Dr. Archibald Hart was invited to New York City to be the psychologist responsible to guide the police department the fire department on this incredible stressful situation we call 9-11 and uh, he presented to them from psychological research this graph and uh, demonstrated how that if you have stress for two weeks, it turns into a negative impact and is going to end up being compromising you, pushing you into all kinds of physiological problems, mental problems, depression, anxiety, and on and on. And uh, he was able to persuade both the fire department and the police department that if anybody is working in the hole, they called it at 9-11, for two weeks in, they got to have two weeks off. There's got to be two weeks off in order to restabilize their system because we can, we're only built to manage a maximum of two weeks of stress. How long can you run from a lion, huh? Well, there's myths that we embrace that, for example, I perform best when I'm under stress or I really do well under stress. These are lies. You don't perform best under stress and you really are not doing well. You may think that you are, but you really are not. I'm, I'm not under stress and I hate stress. And of course, these are myths. Simply not true. 
that uh, uh, number eight, all chronic stress enduring more than two weeks is damaging bad stress and the only good stress is what we call acute stress that lasts less than two weeks. And it's just the way that it is. So to manage your stress is to manage your death and to manage your stress is to manage your adrenaline. I'll come back in another session and demonstrate how we manage our adrenaline. I, I hope we can philosophically get it, get our heads and hearts around this, and then recognize, okay, I manage stress by minimizing what stimulates the stress. Less and less and less stimulants for stress. I can't avoid it. It's the world I'm in. Stress is a part of my life minimize the stimulant and maximize what is a mitigant. What mitigates stress, maximize those gifts God has given me while I'm minimizing the stimulants of stress and thereby manage our death, hopefully to finish well. That's the plan. God bless you.